Hey guys, happy Thursday. We are here again. Um, sorry my camera is like really grainy today. I'm not really sure what's going on with it. I really need a new laptop, but I have no money, so here I am. Um, but luckily, the quality of my face will not impact the quality of what we're going to talk about today and how that lesson is going to go. So why don't we go ahead and get that started. For those of you who it's your first time ever seeing me, my name is Jessica Nadzem. I am a fifth year AP biology teacher. I love plants and coffee and my dog and that's about all I got. <laughs> I love lots of things, but especially those. So anyway, we're going to talk today about the environmental impacts on enzyme function. So we've already talked about enzyme function. If you saw me what was it last Wednesday? I think it was last Wednesday. We already talked about this. So, um, or at least how structure and function are gonna impact. Remember, if you change the shape of the enzyme, the enzyme is not gonna work. And then as a result, it's not gonna function. And then depending on what you're using for it for, that could be really, really, really inconvenient. So let's learn about how the environment can impact these things. Cause depending on where they are in your body and how homeostasis is going in your body, it could not be so good. So let's learn about that. You're gonna learn a lot about your body and how it needs to be in homeostasis today. So boop, here we go. Oh, here's my normal plug. As a millennial, I'm attached to my phone. I'm attached to my computer. I'm attached to social media. If you're like me, you are too. So please, please, please click, click, click click, click, and uh, follow us at Think Fiveable on your Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. We also offer my personal Twitter. I don't use Instagram, not for teaching, and I don't have a YouTube channel because I don't think I'm cool enough to be YouTube famous. But feel free to follow us. Show us when you're doing stuff. If you ever have questions, definitely send us a tweet or a message on Instagram because we would love to help you. And if you don't ask, we can't help you. So let us know. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Let's talk about what we're going to talk about today. So today, you may notice there's a lot going on on this thing. I'm going to go ahead and make it bigger because I know you didn't come here to see my face. You came here to see science. So la, 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 la. All right, so let's take a look. So we're going to be taking a look at how temperature, pH, and substrate concentration impact your enzyme function. We're also going to take a look at inhibition, which apparently I forgot to add on here because... You know, it's Thursday, and sometimes grown-ups forget things, kids. So bear with us. Let's just go ahead and throw that on there, because this is a Google Doc. I can live in the moment. It's nice. See? Boom. Already fixed. So um, it's not going to be in that order. I'm not going to fix it again, but it's okay. Um, we're going to talk about that inhibition, as well as um, those three different things and how they impact the environment. So I've got some GIFs going on over there. I've got a Coke can being eaten by acid. Um, just so you know, there's a lot of YouTube videos of what happens when you stick stuff in acid. And oh my gosh, it's definitely like a McDonald's cheeseburger in one and it turned black and it was awful. But we're gonna talk about acid. So next time you see it in like a sci-fi movie, you're gonna be like, I know how that works. Uh, we're gonna talk about temperature. So whether it's too hot, like that thermometer that's just busting out or whether it's too cold, like that chili kit. We're gonna look at all that and then question mark, we're going to look at some practice AP questions, which I know that's what y'all really want anyway, because you're like, okay, get ready for my test. So I'm a teacher still, teachers, your teacher's going to teach you even if your teachers love you. So even if they sometimes are a little cranky with you, they still love you. I promise they wouldn't do this job otherwise. All right. I always like to plug this whenever I'm talking about enzymes, just because it's so important that you understand this. Um, let's see who all we got here. Do, 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 do. Jody Soleil. Hi, Sandra. Shreya. Hi, Shreya. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Lucia. Guys, I'm so happy you're here. So a couple of you were here last week when I went on this spiel about protein structure. Um, I'm going to keep it brief, but I just want to remind you all protein structure is going to be so important to this because if you don't understand it, enzymes are rough. So just a quick reminder, enzymes um, are proteins. Proteins have four levels of structure. As they get more complex, that's because there are more bonds that hold those amino acids together. Those bonds can be between R groups or between carboxyls or amines. Those are going to be the basic um, structures in the actual amino acid over here. Um, and so 
you've got to have your protein structure mastered or your head is going to hurt. So just wanted to plug that because we're going to get into some complex stuff today. Please let me know if you have any questions because that's why the space is here. Otherwise, you could just watch like a Khan Academy video or something, except I'm here to answer your questions. Whereas if you were just watching Khan Academy, you'd have to be like, uh, aren't you glad I'm here? I promise not to make that face again. All right. So let's talk about what happens to enzymes when you change their shape. So not when you change your shape, why they change their shape. So enzymes, as we know, as I just talked about, uh, uh, um, they are these coiled up just messes. If you've seen my show before, um, you know, I always have my handy dandy measuring tape. And this is going to be what I use to demonstrate protein. So all protein is, is the long chain. It gets all crumbled up because it has bonds. Okay. But with a protein, whenever you modify its environment in some way, whether that's temperature or pH, um, that's going to interact with the bonds in the actual protein. And that's going to change the shape of the protein. It's going to cause it to unfold. And once it unfolds, it's got a different shape. It's not going to work the same. It's not going to react with the, what's the thing that the enzyme reacts with? Someone tell me, I need some student output. That's the thing the enzyme reacts with. Substrate, very good, Shreya, thank you. Very good, Soleil. Substrate, so if you change the shape of your measuring tape protein, it's not gonna react with the substrate anymore because remember, they've gotta have the same shape, they've gotta have the same charge, all those things. So now, you may notice down here this thing that says renaturation. I do want to say it says explicitly in the AP Biology um, curriculum guide, make sure students know denaturation is not always permanent. There are times when you can renature a protein, that is take it from its denatured unfolded form and put it back together. I don't, I'll be perfectly honest, I don't know any examples of that. I haven't heard of any examples of that, but I also haven't dug that deep so it's there. If you see a question on it, now you know you can renature an enzyme. Um, but again, I don't know of any specific examples. I know more about why they denature in the first place. So that's what I got for you there. Any questions on denaturation? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. So let's talk about enzymes and temperature. So again, I've got a couple of temperature related things here. Uh, for all my SpongeBob fans out there, I've got this cute little angry Squidward. It's like a little thermometer when he goes, and then he explodes because his temperature is too high. Ah, ha, ha, ha. And then I know you guys all grew up with Frozen, right? I mean, I was in college when Frozen came out and I still saw it. Like it was a sensation. But in Frozen, you know, the girl, spoiler alert, turns into like a nice statue and she's shivering and freezing and cold. So enzymes are real picky about their temperature as well. If you make it too hot, uh, they don't like that. If you make it too cold, they don't like that either. So they're gonna be really picky about that. Um, there are a couple specifics you should know though. And so you're gonna see this kind of graph all the time. Just so you know, you're gonna be sick of it. I apologize. Just wait till you have to learn photo systems. Those are even worse. JK, I think I have to teach that in a couple weeks. It's really not that bad. Anyway, do, 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 do. So we have these graphs and it shows as temperature gets higher, the rate of reaction goes up to a certain point. It's going pretty exponentially. It's just going up, 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 up. But then it hits that like 37 degrees and then what happens? What happens at 37 degrees Celsius? It goes down, it denatures. Very good, Sandra, very good, Shreya. Um, pop quiz, what is 37 degrees Celsius in Fahrenheit? Does anyone have an idea? If you don't know, 98. It's actually, Shreya, very good. It's 98.6. Who else is 98.6? Disc kid. Yeah. So you are normally 98.6. If you're not, you usually have a fever. Um, if you go below 98.6, you're going to want to get that checked out. Just so you know, you're probably a little chilly. But so this is um, an example of an enzyme we would actually find in humans. And so we have this point at the top. What do we call this point at the top? What do we call that? What do we call that point at the top of the little slopey slope? Starts with an O. Starts with an O. Three, two, one. Okay. So 
This part up here, this is called the optimum. So where the rate of reaction is highest, we can see that the optimum rate of reaction occurs at that 37 degrees Celsius. That's the optimum. That's a very common question on AP exams. What is the optimum? So I would scribble down that vocabulary in your handy dandy notebook. Yeah, that was a Blue's Clues reference. I hope you guys know what that is. Um, but so enzymes have that optimum temperature. In the case of it being too cold, what happens to molecules and atoms when temperatures lower? What happens, this is going back to like your physical science and chemistry, but humor me, what happens to molecules when it gets cold? They put on little sweaters. Very good, Shreya, they slow down. So um, molecules are constantly bouncing off the walls. They're moving, they're moving, they're bouncing, they're like little ping bongs. Oh, and Sandra, good point too, they get compacted, they get pushed closer together. So when it's cold, they're not moving very quickly. Can substrates and enzymes react with one another and come into contact with one another if they're moving so slowly? Yes, no, no. Shreya, very good. They can at a lower rate, but at a certain point, it will actually not work at all. And so you can see that here on this graph, it's still kind of working where it's cold down here, but especially once you get to the bottom, it's, it's pretty useless. It's not doing anything. So you don't really want cold because it may not even denature the enzyme, but it's gonna prevent it from working because the molecules are just moving too slowly. But then on the flip side, we do want a certain level of heat because that's gonna make the molecules move faster and faster and faster so that they bump into something, hopefully the substrate. And that's a good thing. But again, at that 37 degrees, we hit that optimum. And after that, once it gets too hot, that's when it starts breaking down the structure. What is it breaking in the structure that causes denaturation? What is that? What's it breaking in the protein or the enzyme structure? Not the active site. Think of protein structure. The bonds, very good. So like, it's break, very good, Shreya. It's breaking down the actual bonds that hold that protein together because the molecules, the atoms, again, they're moving so, so quickly, those bonds actually start to break. And that's what's gonna change the shape and ultimately change the active site because it's gonna be a different shape. So temperature is very important. You don't want it too low because then the molecules don't move fast enough. Um, but you also don't want it to be too hot because then it breaks the bonds and the shape falls apart. So balance, as I've said, every single time I do this song and dance, biology is all about balance. If you don't have that, you're not gonna be happy. Okay, so let's talk about enzymes and pH. Um, Oh, I hope it does it in this GIF, but it's a really, yeah, there it goes. Okay, it's pink. Um, this is just like a pop question. It has nothing to do with biology, but what's that thing you guys do where you like have to pour a tiny amount of liquid into the flask and it turns pink? What's that lab y'all have to do? I'm just curious who knows. Four, three, two. Okay, I'll go ahead and just say it. So the lab that you do, that you will do in chemistry, it's the classic chemistry experiment. It's called a titration. And so what's happening in a titration, you are actually taking an acid and neutralizing it with a base. And so the thing that makes it pink is called phenylthalene. It's an indicator. All that an indicator is, is something that changes color in a certain environment. So you know that something has happened. But it turns pink when it becomes a certain level of, of pH. And that's how you know, oh, it's more acidic. Oh, it's more basic. So pH is gonna be really important to enzymes because while the temperature of your body has to pretty much be 98.6, if there's a part of your body that's not 98.6, except maybe your skin, you're gonna to wanna to get that checked out because you may not have that body part for very long. Um, body temperature's gotta be pretty constant, 98.6 the whole way through. Your pH on the other hand is all over the place because you got your stomach, which is gonna be real acidic. You got your mouth, which is gonna be real, um, Base, neutral, you got alkaline phosphatase, which is gonna be really, really basic. So different enzymes, all of which are occurring in your body are gonna be different pHs. So we've got an acidic one, pepsin. Where are we gonna find that pepsin? Where do we find pepsin? Where do we find pepsin? The stomach, very good, Shreya, very good, Sandra. So pepsin is found in the stomach. It's actually a protein, uh, enzyme that breaks down protein. So when you, I'm assuming none of you are vegetarians. If you are, that's great. You eat other foods with proteins, but I'm just gonna go with a classic protein example, like a steak or um, a piece of chicken. There's a lot of proteins in those foods. And so when you chomp down on them for dinner, 
and it goes down your throat and down into your belly, you have special enzymes called pepsin that break down that protein so you can harvest it and put it in your muscles and make you strong. Why does that pepsin have to be at such a low pH optimum though? Why can't it be neutral? Why does pepsin need to be at such a low pH? The stomach has hydrochloric acid in it. Your stomach is very acidic, very good Tria, very good Sandra. Um, your stomach is an acidic wasteland. And that's a good thing because that acid breaks down all the stuff we eat, um, whether it's ice cream you had for dinner or chicken, whatever it is. You need some acid to break that down in your belly. So pepsin has to be acidic because otherwise it would just get denatured in all that acid. So it's optimum is acidic. Now, on the other hand, you have something called salivary amylase. It's going to gross you out a little bit. It's in your spit. No, it's in there. It's in your spit. Um, salivary amylase. Amylase is a protein that's actually going to be used to break down carbohydrates. So back to like ice cream. <laughs> There's a lot of sugar in ice cream, which is why it tastes so sweet, which is why it tastes so good. To break down that ice cream, which I will be having shortly after this stream, and it's a reward for myself working this late on a Thursday night. Um, I'm going to go eat some ice cream. I'm going to need a bunch of spit. I'm going to keep it in my face. Don't worry. Um, because it's going to start actually digesting that sugar before it even goes down into my stomach. Convenient, I guess. I know it does this to break down other stuff, other sugars, I mean. But it's got to be a real neutral pH. Why does salivary amylase need to be a more neutral pH? Why can't it be acidic? It's for digestion, the same as pepsin. Why can't salivary amylase be acidic like pepsin? Think, think, think. The mouth isn't as acidic. Very good. Your mouth is pretty neutral. I mean, I could do something gross, but I'm not going to. I could like, you know, the thing where you like lick your hand or whatever. Um, if I was to lick my hand or get spit on something, it wouldn't make that thing dissolve. Otherwise, my teeth would have eroded like 20 years ago. Okay. Your mouth isn't acidic. You don't want your mouth to be acidic. You're not a dragon. You don't need to do that. You, so as a result, we have a more neutral pH in our mouth, which is good. And so that's how the salivary amylase is going to operate. I've got to move on, but I am going to talk about this last one. This last one is going to be way more basic. And so it's going to be on the higher end of that pH scale. And that just means it's operating in a more basic environment. Any questions about enzyme and pH? Okay, go team. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm still talking about pH here. I need to stress something to you. So I'm gonna make my face big for a minute, to stress the importance of it. You don't have to know this equation. You don't have to be able to do calculations with it. You do not have to do that. You don't have to do calculations with that. There's plenty of other things we're gonna make you do calculations with. We're not gonna make you do calculations with that. So this pH equals negative log subscript 10 times the concentration of hydrogen ions. Um, guys, whenever you see these brackets around something, that means concentration. So this is concentration, oops, sorry, of hydrogen ions. You're never gonna have to calculate anything with this on an AP exam, but you do need to recognize it because the way that we measure pH, pH is a measure of the hydrogen ions that we have and that's how we figure out how acidic things are and how basic things are. Because if you look, let me make this bigger, here. So if we say an acid is strong, that means it dissociates. That means you've got ions and they completely disconnect. So HCl, what kind of acid is HCl? What kind of acid is HCl? What do we call that acid? What is HCl? Someone said it earlier in the chat. What is HCl? Hydrochloric acid, very good, Shreya. So hydrochloric acid is HCl. That's the one you always see in the movies. They're like, I'm gonna dump hydrochloric acid on him. <laughs> it's what they do. Um, because hydrochloric acid, especially in strong molarities, large molarities, is highly corrosive. I mean, it can dissolve a car. It's bad. <laughs> because when you dissociate these hydrogen and chloride ions, 
That is, you separate them, they are just going to eat away at everything because those negative charges are just, and positive charges are just looking for stuff to chomp, chomp, chomp. So that's how pH works. And it's going to impact protein structure because you're going to go from having this cute little loop de loop, and that's where your active site is, and it's going to completely unfold. The reason for that is if you've all of a sudden got all these little hydrogens floating around and OHs or whatever, it's going to completely interrupt the hydrogen bonding of the protein. What levels of protein structure use hydrogen bonding? What levels of protein structure use hydrogen bonding? Remember, there's four levels. Which of the four use hydrogen bonding to make the protein fold up? Secondary is one, very good. What else? Tertiary, very good, Tria. One more. Quaternary, very good, Tria. Secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. So I'm gonna go back to this for just a second. So you can see here, secondary structure, it's gonna use um, hydrogen bonding. Tertiary structure is going to use it as well. Um, it's not in a picture here, but it does occur. Um, quaternary structure is going to have hydrogen bonding as well. So if you're messing with three levels of protein structure, pH can be extremely detrimental to an enzyme because it's going to completely unfold. All those bonds completely denature it. It's no bueno. So does anyone have any further questions on pH and how it's going to affect enzymes? All right, let's move on. You guys are so quiet tonight. Y'all need a Thanksgiving break. That'll help, or a fall break. Okay. Let's talk about substrate concentration. What's a substrate? What's a substrate? It's a reactant, very good, Tria. Um, substrates are gonna be the things that react with enzymes. So for example, lactase is an enzyme. What does lactase react with? Lactose, very good. Where do we find lactose? Very good, Soleil, very good, Tria. Milk, we find lactose in milk, dairy, ice cream, very good, Sandra. Um, cheese, the things that make up like 80% of my diet. So if I was ever lactose intolerant, I don't know what I'd do. Um, but so let's, let's just pretend here for the sake of this um, example that these um, big purple enzymes are lactase and the little purple molecules are the lactose. So when we have a low substrate concentration, remember those brackets surrounding something, um, that's concentration. So when we have a low substrate concentration, that means we have a bunch of reaction or a bunch of enzymes, not so much substrate. And then as we have a more medium substrate concentration, do you notice how now two out of three of the enzymes are all reacting? Because remember, these molecules are constantly bouncing around like a pinball machine. Pinball machine, not pinball. Pinball machine. And so they're hoping just to bounce into the right enzyme. So then by the time you get to the high substrate concentration, all of the enzymes are taken up. And you see here how it plateaus. We say at this point when it plateaus that it is saturated. So that saturated, that flat plateau line means that there's no more enzymes. So it doesn't matter how much substrate you add, no matter what, it's gonna be a flat line. It can't react any further because it's used up all the enzyme it's got. We see the exact same thing over here where we have our test tubes. So again, we have our, they're blue and pink now instead of pink and purple. But so these blue ones, those are gonna be our enzymes. And there's only one substrate in there. We get up to 5%, we got two, 10%, we got four, 20, 40, and 80%. By the time we get to 80%, we've only got like seven or eight enzymes, but all that substrate. And so all that substrate is going completely unmatched because there's no more enzymes. And so we say it's saturated, it's completely plateaued. That's what that graph is gonna look like. I'm gonna warn you guys now, they love to ask about these graphs. Um, about the temperature graph, and they're gonna want you to draw a curve to show what it looks like. The pH graph, they're gonna want you to draw a curve to show what it looks like. The um, enzyme substrate concentration, they're gonna want you to draw a graph that shows what it looks like. So in your notes, in your flashcards, whatever it is you do, you need to practice drawing those three graphs and be able to identify the optimum 
and the point of saturation. Optimum point of saturation for those three graphs. Does anyone have any questions about these? We're about to move into competition. All right, y'all, on we go. We're just moving and grooving. So let's talk about competition. <clears throat> so we're gonna talk about two types of competition today. Um, inhibition is basically any time a reaction can't occur because something is inhibiting it, something is stopping it. I like to think of it as like when there's a boot on someone's car, you have altered the shape of the vehicle and now it can't drive. So you're sitting in your car and you're like, I wanna go places, but you can't, there's a boot on your car. Um, I also think of sports in basketball when the guy's like, not in my house, if you've ever seen that commercial, and when they completely block a goal. Um, or I just like Wonder Woman, so she's like, no, 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 no. It's blocking the reaction, it's blocking the thing from happening. And that's competitive inhibition. There is something competitive getting in the way. So the way this works in enzymes, you have the active site and the active site normally reacts with the substrate, does the little induced fit thing and then it goes off and does its thing, it gets recycled, whatever. But when you have a competitive inhibitor, there's something that fits in that active site that is not the substrate. And it can actually block the enzyme, which means the substrate can't get to it. And so if we look at this graph, we see the substrate concentration goes up and it plateaus right around here. But when you add a competitive inhibitor, it's actually just a gradual positive curve. Because remember, those molecules are constantly moving. So it doesn't mean that every single one is inhibited. It just means that there's a higher chance some of them are gonna be inhibited. Does anyone have any questions about um, competitive inhibition before I go on to the example for it? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and go on. So competitive inhibition, you can think of it as being kind of scary. Um, whenever I think about it, um, usually because I just made a lactase example, kids always ask, is that why I'm lactose intolerant? Is it because there's a uh, competitive inhibitor blocking my lactase? And I'm like, I mean, it could be, it could just be of a mutation and you don't even make it. Um, but the other time that I think of competitive inhibitors, they're actually really beneficial in medication. There's actually a competitive inhibitor called methotrexate. Um, it's a pharmaceutical drug, it's been around for a while and it's used to treat arthritis and certain types of cancer. The reason is it blocks a certain enzyme that is made by cancerous cells and prevents them from creating more cancer cells. So sometimes competitive inhibition is a good thing because I mean, we don't want more cancer cells, that's for sure. We want them to go wonder woman, no, 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 no. So yeah, sometimes they're good. Sometimes they could be bad. Maybe that is why some people are lactose intolerant. But if it's stopping cancer, I'm okay with it. All right, let's go ahead and talk about the other type of competition um, or the other type of inhibition. So this is a non-competitive inhibitor, non-competitive inhibitor. We also call these allosteric. So non-competitive inhibitors, I like to think of them as like an on-off switch. On, off, on, off, on, off. Because the way they work, they have not one, but two active sites. Uno, dos, one, two. And so one active site is just for the enzyme. So you can see here on this one, it's got the active site, it's got another active site, and it's got a substrate, <clears throat> but it's also got an inhibitor. And if the inhibitor binds to the second active site, what do you notice about the other active site? If the inhibitor binds, what happens to the active site? It changes shape, very good Soleil, very good Sandra. And so can it do the reaction anymore? No. So these are, like I said, on off switches because if the inhibitor is attached, that essentially turns the enzyme off. But then if it unattaches from that second active site, then it's back on. So it's that on, off, on, off type thing. So we see this in, um, there's a drug called penicillin. You may have heard of penicillin. It's an antibiotic they give you when you're sick. Um, unless you have a penicillin allergy, then they better not give you that drug when you're sick. But penicillin is actually an allosteric inhibitor that blocks enzymes in bacteria from creating cell wall. In case you didn't know, the bacteria that usually get you sick makes cell walls. And that's why it's hard for your immune system to kill them and make you better. So penicillin will actually stop those bacteria from making a cell wall so your immune system can swoop in and be like, ha, 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 I got you. That's what they do. They speak, they're sentient. You get my point though. 
So that's an example of a non-competitive inhibition that's going to be really, really good because it turns off that cell wall making in enzymes in bacteria that make you sick. I'm sure there's other examples that are probably not as good for you, but that's the example I have. So again, going back to the importance of graphs, you can see here you've got where you've got a competitive inhibitor and then the normal enzyme. So we've already seen these black and red lines. A non-competitive inhibitor is going to usually be a lot more um, impactful on reaction rate. You can see this blue line is a lot lower than the other two. There's a lot less reaction going on, and it's plateauing a little bit earlier. So non-competitive inhibitors are going to be really, really effective at making sure the reaction doesn't occur. Does anyone have any questions about allosteric or non-competitive inhibition? We're about to move on to the practice round. Got warm up. Does anyone have any questions before we move into the practice round? I got not one, not two, not three, not four, not, but five questions today. So if you have any last minute questions, now it's time to ask. Gotta roll up my sleeves for this one. Do some stretches. Three, two, one. All right, I'm gonna assume y'all are ready. Here it comes. Tell me A, B, C, or D. So butterflies in the genus Coleus live in the Rocky Mountains where they experience a wide range of temperatures. Different variants of a particular glycolytic enzyme and the flight muscles are optimally active at different temperatures. Within the same population, some individual butterflies fly most effectively at 29 degrees Celsius, while others are most effective at 40 degrees Celsius. Still others can be equally active at both temperatures. So which of the following is most consistent with the observed butterfly behavior? Yeah, A, B, C, D. What do you guys think? Tell me your thoughts. Tell me your answers. A. I see Shreya's got an answer. I see Soleil says A. Sandra says A. And dun 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 dun. A. Very good. Okay. So they're gonna have two variants of that enzyme. They're gonna have an enzyme that works at that 29 degrees, and they're gonna have one that works at that 40 degrees. And so they don't really care what temperature it is. They can survive at both. Very good. Let's talk about the second question. <clears throat> Sorry, I've been talking too long. My throat doesn't like it. Woo. So like I said, there's going to be a lot of graphs. I've already told you, you're going to need to know how to draw these graphs, identify the optimum, identify the point of saturation. Um, and this one, there's actually going to be two parts, this one and the next one. <clears throat> Enzymes with their highest activity at an alkaline or basic pH are represented by which of the following graphs? So which one has the most activity at an alkaline or basic pH? You see Shreya has answered. Soleil says B. Sandra says B. Whoop, whoop. Very good. So only graph number two, and the reason, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. It does hit that point of saturation, but by the time it does it, it's all the way over here in the basic part. Over here, the optimum's in the acidic. Over here, the optimum is super in the acidic, and over here, it doesn't really seem to matter. <clears throat> I'm so sorry, I don't know what's happening to my throat. Okay, next part of the question. So graphs representing enzymes sensitive to changes in pH so these are the most sensitive to changes in pH are gonna be which ones? Which one cares about a change in pH? A, B, C, D, or E? One, two, three, or four? Tell me your answers. Tell me things. Pretty please. And this should say question number three. Sorry, we are in fact on question number three. We're already halfway there, y'all. I see E, I see E. Come on, Soleil, what do you think? Mm -hmm. E with a question mark. Well, congrats. E with a question mark is still an E. That is, in fact, correct. One, two, and three. Yeah. All of these have a different optimum at a different pH. This one is at like seven. This one's at like one. This one is up here anywhere that's basic. They all have a different optimum, whereas this one, it doesn't care. Sorry, not. I'm not pointing. This one, graph four, it doesn't care what pH it is. It's just like, yeah, I'm just here to have a good time and be an enzyme, yeah. Very good, guys. <clears throat> All right, question four. 
A tissue culture of vertebrate muscle was provided with constant excess supply of glucose under anaerobic conditions, starting at time zero, da 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 da. Amounts of pyruvic acid and ATP <clears throat> produced were measured. I am so sorry, guys, I'm losing my voice. The solid line in the graph above represents pyruvic acid produced. ATP levels were also found to be at highest points at A and C, lowest at B and D. Substance X, what is it? I see Shri has answered, what is substance X? So substance X is when the dotted line was added or indicated by the dotted line, I apologize. And all of a sudden it goes from way up here to way down here. Is it both be coming from that way? So what is substance X? Okay, Shreya, Soleil, both saying inhibitor. What do you think, Sandra? Tell me, Sandra. B? Ooh. It's B. Very good. It's an inhibitor. Yeah, because you guys saw earlier, whenever it's super low down on the graph like this, like completely cuts the reaction rate, yeah, it's going to be an inhibitor. Great job, guys. All right, last one. You tell me. Which one's going to be used to determine the rate of an enzyme-catalyzed reaction? What would you use? <clears throat> BBB? Even B with a question mark is still B. Very good. How quickly is the substrate disappearing? Because that means it's reacting. Great job, y'all. All right. Well, guys, that's all I got. Y'all did awesome today. <clears throat> Sorry, I keep clearing my throat. I don't know what's happening in my voice. Um, so this is kind of good timing. Um, but what do y'all think? Do y'all have any questions? Do you have any concerns? Can I go ahead and give you the slides? Um, I know this went a little bit quicker than I thought considering it's so much information, but like I said, it's mostly just the graphs and the optimum, the saturation. As long as you know how the environment is gonna impact those enzymes, you're gonna have it down. That's pretty much all you need. So, questions, comments, concerns? My hair is acting up. I need to stop making my face big because then I pay too much attention to it. Which graphs do we need to know? Very good question, Soleil. I would know temperature, pH, and substrate. Temperature, pH, and substrate. You're welcome, Shreya. Soleil, I hope that helped. Um, Sandra, it was great to see you again. Guys, I hope this has been helpful. I know it was a little short, but I'll be honest, my throat's kind of hurting now, so I think I'm about ready to get off. So. There's a link to the slides. Oh, thank you, Lucia. Thank you for coming. Um, I hope this was helpful for you guys. I'm going to go eat some ice cream and hope it makes my throat feel better. Um, I hope you guys have a wonderful evening and a good week. And I'll be back not next week, but the week after. So I'm looking forward to seeing you guys again. Have a great night. Bye-bye.